Hey guys and welcome to Cool Vision. I've decided to travel around Central Asia and visit some of the countries that used to be part of the USSR. So let's discover ancient cities, architectural masterpieces, delicious food, warm weather, deserts, mountains and cotton. Welcome to Uzbekistan. It's a landlocked country in Central Asia and the former Soviet Union Republic that became independent in 1991. It borders Kazakhstan to the north, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan to the southwest, Tajikistan to the southeast and Kyrgyzstan to the northeast. Today the population of the country is almost 35 million people. For most tourists, Uzbekistan starts with its capital city, Tashkent. It's a huge city with a population of 2.9 million people, busy traffic, bazaars and green-wide avenues. The center of the city is Amir Timur Square, a plaza with fountains and esplanades around the statue of Amir Timur, who was a legendary ruler from the 1300s. This is where you find the famous Uzbekistan Hotel, lots of restaurants and museums. Tashkent has a reputation of not being the most exciting place in the country, which is probably true to a point. It's a large city with a lot of traffic, noise, and all the things that come with it. But Tashkent has a lot of things to offer if you look around. Where else in the world would you find so many examples of seismic modernism? Seismic modernism is the term for the large-scale reconstruction of Tashkent after the 1966 earthquake. More than 300,000 people lost their homes due to this earthquake that lasted for several months. A huge reconstruction began, which brought a lot of people from the USSR republics who volunteered to help. Tashkent was restored in three and a half years, and the reconstruction gave the city several new residential areas. It became a showcase Soviet city, combining Soviet architectural styles and national decorations. In 1977, Tashkent got a subway system. Today it has four lines and 43 stations. Most stations are so beautiful you can consider them works of art and they reflect typical national motives like cotton, agriculture and such. But some stations really stand out, like the Cosmic Station or Turkestan Station, one of the most recent ones. Wow, pretty impressive. This is basically a museum and a very affordable one. The entrance is just 15 cents. Until recently, you weren't allowed to film inside the subway. Luckily, this restriction was lifted a few years ago. Tashkent is a car-dependent city. You can find a seven-lane road even around the central part. And the driving style of the locals, oh, it leaves much to be desired. Taxi rides are dirt cheap. Most of the time, you're not going to pay more than one or two dollars. What about salaries? The average salary in the city is around 4.4 million. Sounds like a lot, I know, but it's in the local currency, which translates to only about $400. The city is very modern and traditional at the same time. Business and modern high-rise districts coexist with traditional Uzbek bazaars and old low-rise communities where everyone knows each other. They call these communities Mahalas. Let's take a look at one of them. People are so friendly. This gentleman invited us to his house for some tea. His family has lived in this house for decades. <laughs> Привет, привет. Восемь месяцев. Восемь. And then we saw some ladies picking up walnuts. This looks like countryside, right? But we're actually in the middle of the city. Здесь ночью посторонний не ходит. А вот кто будет ходить посторонний, сразу говорит, кому ты идешь? А в многоэтажном доме разницы нету. Это ары с 15 века. Раньше смотрели с него пили. Mm. Any kind of cuisine you can find in Tashkent. But if you want to try the most famous national dish, plov, go to the center of plov, a tribe by the famous TV tower. They have several varieties of plov and you can watch the entire cooking process. Trust me, you're gonna love it. Normally it's cooked by a man and it's cooked with lamb or beef. I got the lamb version and it comes with rice and different vegetables like carrots, onions and vegetable oil. Now, it can be topped with a lot of things. Uh, mine came with a quail egg, a regular egg and kazi, which is a sausage made from horse meat. 
Sounds pretty exciting, right? So let's try it. Finally. Tashkent is a green city. There's a countless number of parks, and many of them represent different cultures, like this Japanese garden in the very heart of the city, or this Korean garden. Over the last five to six years, the city changed dramatically. New parks and business centers were constructed, and now there's a real construction boom going on. Tashkent is becoming a real modern metropolis. Now let's talk to some locals. Ребят, привет! Привет! Как вас зовут? Фарух. Мухаммад Надар. Расскажите, как жить в Ташкенте, что вам нравится? Нравится инфраструктура, нравятся люди, кухня, да, главное, горы рядом. Люди очень добрые, на самом деле отзывчивые очень. Вы студенты? Да, да мы студенты. Мы учимся в Эмстер Университете. What are your plans for the future? So, uh, right now I'm studying uh, at Webster University and uh, in the future uh, we can study in, in the US, in the Webster uh, in St. Louis or in Webster in Geneva. In like Austria. take a semester yes. in the US and yes, then come two, back? Yes, two, two semesters. Right, and uh, what's your program? What are you studying? Uh, MIS. MIS, it's a kind of programming. Oh, yeah, yeah. Management uh, information system. Yes. Yeah. Sub subscribe. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, guys. The city is very safe, too. Okay, I'll have a separate video about Tashkent, so let's move on. Let's get a car and travel outside of the capital. Funny fact about cars in Uzbekistan is that 90% of them are Chevrolet. Yes, you heard that right. 90% of cars are Chevrolet. So if you look around, Chevrolet, Chevrolet, Chevrolet. And guess what kind of car I rented? Well, that's the sign. It's Chevrolet. Chevrolet Tracker. Wow, we decided to go outside of Tashkent today and drive to the mountains and we stopped to check out the scenery. It's Charvak Reservoir. Huge body water and the locals said there's plenty of fish here and pretty big ones, you know. So we might as well stop to enjoy some fried fish later on. But for now, let's continue to the mountains. Now, who would have thought that just 65 kilometers away from the city of Tashkent, there's a winter ski resort. It's called Amir Soy, right behind me. But right now it's September and it's warm. It's actually pretty hot, it's 25 Celsius. But there's still plenty of things to do here. We're gonna take that cable car that's gonna take us to the very top of the mountain and there's gonna be some breathtaking views and I'm gonna show them to you in a second. If you love skiing or hiking in the summer, good, because there are Shimgen Mountains not far from Tushkent. And finally, we are at the summit of Amersoy, 2,290 meters above sea level. You know, it's moments like this that you're gonna remember the most. Wow, just me sitting here admiring the majestic mountains. While you're here, you can travel around the mountains and visit some remote villages, and you're gonna see some incredible landscapes like this. Over 50% of the population still lives in rural areas. Life here is like a different planet compared to the life in Tashkent. <laughs> They still cook their own bread and wash clothes by hand. They're also very friendly folks. You can easily find accommodation to stay overnight if you want to, and it's going to be real affordable. I found a guest house for just ten dollars. Let's see what life is like in an Uzbek village. Where are you going? I'm going to the market. What did you buy? Вот яйца, хлеб, лепешку, лепешку, вот. давай покажем. Вот. Смотрите, на узбекский хлеб в нашем стране, а, вот о. так. Он вот. с рисуночком, да, обычно? Да, конечно, вот рисунком. Тут очень хорошо, вот красиво. орех много, красиво, яблоки много, люди, очень хорошие люди есть. Да. Вот школа новую мы строили уже. О, покажите, покажите. Ух ты, какая. Тяну, где тяну? Поближе. Ах, хорошо. Fifty kilometers outside of Tashkent, you're gonna find a very interesting place. It's a solar furnace of Uzbekistan, built in 1981. We are 45 kilometers away from the city of Tashkent, and this is solar furnace of Uzbekistan. 
It uses 10,700 curved mirrors to reach temperatures up to 3,000 Celsius. Why would they want that? Well, it's to study different materials and how they react to different temperatures. You know, initially it was built in 1981 for military purposes, but now it has a lot of civil applications like the working on carbon fibers and, you know, all kinds of new materials that would help in aerospace and um, uh, other applications. And I was so lucky to join a VIP group, so we got a chance to go on the very top. So is it for cooking delicious crusty Uzbek bread, you ask? Not really, but nice try. The place for the solar furnace of Uzbekistan was chosen carefully because the sun shines here for 270 days a year. Now, before we travel to other parts of the country, let's talk about the history of Uzbekistan. These lands were occupied by nomads since the early days. Scythians, Sogdians, Khorezmians, Bactrians were all distant relatives of modern Uzbeks. A huge boost in economic development came from the Great Silk Road that allowed trade and cultural exchange between East and West. The Great Silk Road turned cities like Bukhara and Samarkand into large trade centers. They traded silk, jewelry, spices and horses. At the beginning of the 8th century, Arabs came here. They brought Islam. They also introduced the Arabic alphabet, which the Uzbeks used up to the Soviet days. At the beginning of the 13th century, Chinggis Khan, a ruthless warrior, showed up with his massive army, destroying everything in his path. Many cities like Bukhara and Samarkand were completely ruined, and most part of their population was either killed or enslaved. It took almost a century for these lands to recover. In the 14th century, Amir Timur came to power. He united the lands of Central Asia under the Timurid Empire. It was a time when science and culture were flourishing and left plenty of great monuments to us. In the early 16th century, separate Uzbek principalities were formed, the Hanates of Hiva, Bukhara and Kokand. In the 19th century, they tried to resist the Russian expansion into this area, but failed, thus becoming first a part of the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union. Okay, now let's relocate to Samarkand, the second most famous city in Uzbekistan. To get here, you can take a fast speed train, Afro Siab, or rent a car. But roads are of very mediocre quality, so just keep that in mind. And it's four hours to drive. But I still recommend driving because you're gonna see so much of the countryside, and I think it's well worth it. Along the roads, you'll find homemade dairy products like Iron and Guja. It takes some getting used to, but I've learned to like them. And here we are. Samarkand is the third largest city in the country, with 560,000 people. Along with Bukhara, Samarkand is one of the oldest inhabited cities in Central Asia. From its early days, Samarkand was one of the main centers of Sogdian civilization, an ancient Iranian civilization. Alexander the Great conquered Samarkand in 329 BCE. The city was known as Marikanda by the Greeks. By the way, Samarkand from Sogdian means a stone town and Tushkent from Turkic also means a stone town. That's about all they have in common. See, in Tushkent you have to look for historical sites. In Samarkand you just can't avoid them. The most famous one is the Registan. And right now we're standing at the Registan, which is a plaza surrounded by three madrasas, which is the Arabic word for a seminary. This one is from the 15th century, and the other two are from the 17th century. So there's tons of history here. Let's walk around and let's admire the beauty. The name Registan means a sandy place or desert in Persian. Each madrasa has a beautiful courtyard with souvenir shops, craft shops, and the good thing is everything is locally made. Another place of interest is the Shahi Zinda. It's a necropolis which includes mausoleums and other ritual buildings from as early as the 11th century. A lot of noble people are buried here, among them philosophers and scholars. You'll see some amazing mosaics and tombs beautifully decorated with majolica tiles. Samarkand is so easy to get around. There are small tourist buses circulating between the major sites and it's so convenient.
The Bibi Hanum Mosque is another masterpiece. In the 15th century, is one of the largest and most magnificent mosques in the Islamic world. Bibi Hanna Mosque has to be one of the most impressive buildings in the entire Central Asia. It was built under the reign of Amir Timur. The construction started in 1399, and it was finished in just five years. Unbelievable. They had to bring hundreds and hundreds of workers from different neighboring countries, and they also had to bring over about a hundred elephants from India to carry the heavy loads. It is considered a masterpiece of the Timurid Renaissance. As you have noticed, most of these structures were built under Emir Timur reign. For someone not sophisticated in oriental architecture, you might think they all look kind of similar. Timur's empire was so huge, it stretched from Syria to India, and the capital was Samarkand. There are so many other places to visit in Samarkand, like the Guri Amir, which is a mausoleum of Amir Timur, Uluq Beg Observatory from the 15th century, and so much more. Today, Samarkand has turned into a real tourist city, and I met tourists from all over. Uh, where do you come from? So originally, oh, sorry. Yeah, originally <laughs> Singapore, um, and I live in Oxford, well, actually siblings. Uh, I, I'm John and I live in Oxford in the UK. Um, and I'm Adi, I live in Amsterdam. Before coming to Uzbekistan, did you know much about the country? Um, I did a little bit of homework. I've actually been kind of um, planning it for about like nine months, actually. I think nothing really prepared, prepares you for when you're actually here. It's just the scale of things are just so much bigger and so much more the grandeur just takes, take, really takes you back. So. I had done a little less research. I kind of like to be, leave it to be a little surprised by places. I think just looking at some of these buildings, I think even in this day and age, I, I can't even fathom how they were built, let alone like 500 years ago or a thousand years ago. I'm like, I just, like, I don't know how that architecture was possible then. You know, it's, it's, it's wild, yeah. Recently, another tourist attraction was opened and it's called the Eternal City. It's a new district by the water, which reminded me of a small medieval town. It's so photogenic that I saw a lot of people coming here to do photo shoots. Really cool. Now, before we travel to our next destination, let's visit Urgut, which is a small town not far from Samarkand near the mountains. First of all, it has stunning mountainous landscapes. Second of all, it is known for the grove of plane trees some of which are more than a thousand years old. We are in a city called Urgut, which is not far from Samarkand. Its population is 65,000 people. And right now we're in a place called Chor Chinor, which means four plane trees. Now, that plane tree in particular is 1,100 years old. So old, and it's so big. Uh, it's 35 meters high and it's huge. And in fact, inside of it, there used to be a medrese which is a religious school. This is where people would hide from rain and strong wind. Well, it's pretty dark in here. So this is where they would have their religious teachings and, you know, learn more about the Quran. I ran into a local news crew and gave them an interview. <laughs> Uzbeks, especially in the countryside, are some of the friendliest people you'll ever meet. Even if there's a language barrier, they'll make you feel welcome. When we drove around one of the villages, we met this family. They let me ride their donkey, showed us the surroundings and gave us some honey, walnuts and apples. Great hospitality. We go into the woods to get some nuts. It's a good donkey. Sing <laughs> point. Okay. This is my friend Nur Muhammad. Muhammad. And uh, I'm Slava. And we're drinking tea. In Urgut. 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 <laughs> Okay, now let's relocate to another historical city, and that is Bukhara.
You can get here by a high-speed train or drive. It's going to be another four hours of driving. Bukhara is the seventh largest city in Uzbekistan, with a population of 280,000 people. It was a prominent stop on the Silk Road between the East and the West. Many world-known scholars, artists and philosophers lived and worked here, like Avicenna and Amar Hayam. It still contains hundreds of well-preserved mosques, madrasas, bazaars and caravanserais, dating largely from the 9th to the 17th centuries. For over 2,000 years, the city did not change its location. Let's take a look at some of the sites. Poe Kalan is a huge religious complex consisting of the Kalan Mosque, the Kalan Minaret and the Mir Arab Madrasa. These three structures form a plaza in the center, with the Mir Arab and the Kalan Mosque facing each other. This minaret behind me is known as Kalyan Minaret and is 45 meters high. It was founded all the way in 1127. Now, a hundred years after it was constructed, Chinggis Khan attacked and it was one of the few structures in the city that he spared. Now there is a staircase taking you all the way to the rotunda. In the 12th century, it was known as the Tower of Death because many criminals were executed by being pushed off the tower. But at least they could enjoy a few moments, thrilling moments, before landing. Since we can't climb the minaret, let's climb the Shuhaf Tower and get a good view from there. Drones are not allowed in the country, by the way. A great place in Bukhara to come enjoy some great food and live music in the evening is the Labby House Ensemble, surrounding the pool on three sides. It's a pond, but it was built in 1568 to 1622. There were many ponds like this in ancient Bukhara, and they played the role of major water supply system until the Soviets came. And when the Soviets came, they didn't like the system because it was spreading a lot of diseases, so they got rid of that. Now today, it's mostly playing the role of a focal point of the old city of Bukhara. At night, it turns into a fairy tale with a lot of tourists, lots of cafes and restaurants, and live music. So come here and check it out. Another must-visit place is the Ark of Bukhara. It's a massive fortress that was initially built and occupied around the 5th century AD. It was the residence of the last Han of Bukhara before he was overthrown by the Red Army in 1920. By the way, this is what he looked like. This is a real picture. Now there are a lot of museums housed inside the Ark's buildings. At night in Bukhara, you can attend a performance with a dinner. The one we went to was inside Nadir Divan Begi Madras. Bukhara does a great job of relocating you to the 16th century. Walking around the back streets and entering the courtyards is a lot of fun. You don't know what to expect. It might be a carpet shop, it might be a coffee house, it might be a pottery. I loved it. In Bukhara, there is a good choice of carpets. How much are the carpets? Okay, okay. Do you have any flying carpets? How much are they? Ah, oh, it's too expensive. I guess I'll just keep on shopping. Many of the car and hotels are based in historical houses. We stayed in one that used to be a house of wealthy Jewish gentlemen in the 19th century. Next on the list is the city of Hiva. Once you leave Bukhara, life dies out and you go in through a desert. Crazy to think that just a few centuries ago caravans were traveling through it. it must have been so difficult. And Hiva must have felt like a special place, an oasis surrounded by deserts. After traveling in the desert for days and weeks, the minarets of Hiva must have looked like spaceships back then. Remoteness from the rest of the world made Hiva the most unique town in Uzbekistan. It used to be the capital of Khorezm a large oasis region on the Amudarya River Delta in Western Central Asia. Behind these walls is the inner castle, known as Ichan Kala. 
These massive protective walls of Ichan Kala were built using the clay from the nearby Amudria River. This inner castle has a rectangular form and it has gates on four sides. It became the first UNESCO site in Central Asia. Some of the records indicate that it existed in the 10th century. And one of the legends goes like this. One of Noah's, biblical Noah's sons, Sim, was going through a desert and he found this oasis and he dug up a well and he tasted the water and he loved the water so much that he said, Havak, which means taste so good. And so this whole castle area was founded around that well and it's called Havak Well. Well, I wanted to find the well and visit it, but right now it's located in a private property and the owner of the house lives in Tashkent. And so there's no way to visit that. The very fact that it remains to this day for us to witness is mind-blowing. What are the major sites? Let's start with the Calta Minor Minaret. This minaret is called Calta Minor and is probably one of the most recognized symbols of Hiva. The construction started in 1852 and it was started by Muhammad Amin Khan. But unfortunately he died in 1855, so the construction was never finished. Now his plan was to build the tallest minaret in the entire Muslim world. Now they only got as far as 29 meters, and that's where it got, got its name. Calta Minor means a short minaret. This is the mausoleum of the poet Pahlavan Mahmud, who lived in the 12th and 13th centuries. And what is that building? From above, it doesn't look like anything special. But in fact, it's one of the most exciting buildings in Hiva, Juma Mosque or Friday Mosque. The building is unique in that it has neither portals nor domes. This has got to be one of the most important buildings in Shangri-La. It's called Juma Mosque and it dates back to the 10th century. Now it has a very unusual layout for a mosque. The ceiling is supported by 212 pillars. 59 of them have been replaced over time. The rest are original. Cunha Ark is a fortress within a fortress. The construction of the citadel began in 1686. It was fenced off from the main fortress by a wall and served as the residence of the Hans of Horezm. This is where they worked and lived with their families. The citadel had everything from entertainment facilities, a mint, and even a harem. Make sure you go on top because this is undoubtedly the best place in the city to watch the sunset. Just like Buhara, Hiva takes you back in time and it's so incredible. You will feel like you're in a real medieval city where the spirit of modernity is given out only by the electric wires. Cobbled streets, clay mosques, elaborate patterns and majestic fortress walls. Make sure you do some shopping too. They have a lot of souvenirs to choose from and some cool hats. Look at this, they call them Chorisma. Well, there's a nice selection of hats. Should I wear the black one? Or the white one? See, the purpose of this hat was to protect from the sun. Plus, it's really warm and it's even protecting you from a sword, they say. Also, you can use it as a pillow. In the evening, be sure to catch some shows going on in different places. See this trumpet? It's called carnet. It's a national musical instrument and it can be up to three meters long, so you can imagine how heavy it must be. Most of the monuments in Uzbekistan that remain to this day belong to Islam. But throughout history, many different religions existed here. Zoroastrianism, Buddhism and many others. For example, three hours away from Hiva, you'll find an example of Zoroastrianism. Chilpik Dahma, or the Tower of Silence. It looks like an extinct volcano from a distance. A dead body in Zoroastrianism is considered unclean and elements including earth and fire are considered sacred which means the dead cannot be burned or buried. Therefore, the Zoroastrians built huge towers of silence where they would carry the dead to be eaten by birds and insects. And only after that, they would collect the bones and put them in clay caskets. Did you know that Uzbekistan had a sea? It still does, but it's almost completely gone. Aral Sea. Technically, it was the fourth largest lake in the world, and there were plenty of fish, 
but now it's nothing but the rest of ships. How did it disappear? It all started with the Soviet government's decision to turn Uzbekistan into a cotton producing factory. Most agricultural lands were turned into cotton production. Cotton was used for many things, from clothes, carpets, to rocket fuel and banknotes. But for that to happen, you need a lot of water to water the plantations. So the Soviets diverted the Aral Sea's primary freshwater sources, the Sirdarya and Amudarya rivers, for irrigation of their cotton fields. Aral Sea was quickly drained, with all the fish in it. But the Soviets didn't care. They thought, good, more land for cotton. You know, Jesus was able to turn water into wine, and the USSR was able to turn a sea into a desert. But we're not done yet. Uzbekistan is huge. Now we're going to visit the Fergana Valley. It's located in the eastern part of the country, bordering Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. It's limited by the Tian Shan Mountains in the north and the Alay Mountains in the south. The four major cities here are Kokand, Nemangan, Fergana and Andijan. It takes four hours to get here from Tashkent, and you'll be driving through a mountain range with spectacular views. I mentioned before that the local roads were mediocre, but here for some reason they're perfect. The Fergana Valley is the agricultural heartland of the country. Driving around you'll see cotton fields, vineyards, sunflower fields, apple orchards and so much more. Let's take a quick look at the major cities. Let's start with Nemangan. It's the second largest city in Uzbekistan with a population of 626,000 people. However, it doesn't get many tourists. I wanted to find a hotel on Booking.com and there was only one option. So I had to do it the old fashioned way, drive around town and walk into different hotels to find a room. And that's in a city of over 600,000 people. Nemangan has an important craft and trade center since the 17th century. The main park of the city is Babur Park, named after Emperor Babur, who was born in the Fergana Valley. The park is known for its numerous old plane trees. Nemangan is one of the most conservative cities in Uzbekistan with strong Muslim traditions. At times it felt like being in the Middle East. Many women are wearing the niqab, the Islamic women's dress that covers everything by the eyes. In the 1990s, Nemangan made it in the news for the Wahhabi Islamic movement that started in one of the local mosques. It came from Saudi Arabia, which led to President Karimov banning all the religious fundamentalist groups, believing they were a threat to his regime. But don't worry, it's totally safe today. Nemangan is super cheap. I was able to have a good lunch for $1.5. All of this came to $1.5. Can you guys believe that? The city is like Uzbekistan, but without the tourist part. It's very authentic, busy, crowded, and many people didn't speak Russian, let alone English. <laughs> Of course, it's a good idea to go to the local market. It's the busiest part of the city. And get some apples because Nemangan is famous for its apples. Next, Fergana. It's a city of 380,000 people named after Fergana Valley. Fergana has been a center of oil production since the region's first oil refinery was built near the city in 1908. There's really not much to do in Fergana for a tourist, except for eating at local cafes, strolling through the green parks, taking the ferry's wheel and visiting the local market. It's a relatively new town, only founded in 1876 by the Russians to control the territory of the former Kokand Hanate. A noticeable growth from the city's population began only in the 20th century, and in particular after the Second World War, when many industrial facilities were relocated here. Uh, Next city is Kokand. It's best known for the palace of Hudayar Khan. 
This is probably the most recognized building in all of Fergana Valley. It's called the Palace of Hurayar Han, who was the last Han of Kokand Hanate, which ruled this land from 1709 till 1876, until Russians came here and conquered the land. Now, this Kokand Hanate, uh, they had seven palaces altogether, and each one they built was greater than the previous one. So this is the last one they built. So let's step inside, let's see what it's like. The palace boasts seven courtyards and 113 rooms, 12 of which are open to visitors today. In Kokand, I recommend you visit the beautiful 19th century Juma Mosque. Its colorful minaret in the center stretches up more than 20 meters, supported by giant columns made from Indian redwood trees. This mosque mausoleum also has a lot of craftsmen shops to visit. Так, это парадный наряд, только в Каканде, да, такое встречается? Оп! Все, можно в карман положить. Also in Kokand, you can visit the Museum of Great Scholars and learn something about the wise men from the past. You can also visit some local madrasas and mosques, like Naributa Bay Mosque, built in 1799. Uh, these cities' peoples are very friendly. Uh, there are a lot of historical places. These countries come to a lot of tourists. Uh, then we suggested, uh, suggested uh, tasted in our uh, traditional food, pilaf. It, uh, pilaf is very tested. If you don't mind asking, what's your job? Uh, my job is a counter. Oh, so you you counted money? Yeah, yeah, kind of money. <laughs> That's a good job to have. Good job. All right, it's been nice talking to you. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And finally, Andijan. It's a city of 458,000 people, and it's one of the oldest cities in the Fergana Valley dating back to the 7th and 8th centuries. The city is perhaps best known as the birthplace of Babur, who following a series of setbacks finally succeeded in laying the basis of Mughal dynasty in the Indian subcontinent and becoming the first Mughal emperor. Andijan also gained notoriety in 2005 when the government forces opened fire on a peaceful demonstration that was protesting poor living conditions and corrupt government, killing hundreds in what came to be known as the Andijan Massacre. The highlight of the city is Devanaboy Mosque. It's the largest and most beautiful mosque in Andijan. A magnificent building with two tower and minarets, which can accommodate approximately 7,000 people. The original structure was erected in 1899. The Fergana Valley is the most densely populated area of Central Asia. It is divided between Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Unfortunately, became the most troubled region in Central Asia with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Part of the reason has to do with the division that Joseph Stalin did in the 1930s. The map making ignored the fact that most of the valley was a patchwork of ethnicities, not easily incorporated into national republics. There are many unique traditions in Uzbekistan. For example, the youngest son has to stay with the parents to take care of them. Even when he gets married, he continues to live in the parents' house with his family. Many marriages are said to be prearranged, like in the old days. Women still have very few rights in the marriage, and the husband is always right. This is very true, especially outside of Tashkent. In the capital, it is get more westernized. Weddings are normally huge. 600 guests or more is typical, and anyone can show up basically and eat for free. Cockfighting and ram fighting is popular. No holiday goes without it. People come in hundreds to watch the event. I visited one in the city of Hiva. This is what it looks like. You'll be surprised, but a good fighting ram can go for $5,000 to $10,000, or even more. What's the weather like in Uzbekistan? Very hot summers. Daytime air temperatures frequently surpass 40 Celsius, that is 104 Fahrenheit. Winters are mild, although in some desert parts, winters can be pretty brutal. Now let's talk about food. Local food is delicious and inexpensive. Outside of tourist places, I was able to have a substantial lunch for $2. Uzbeks love drinking tea. 
they have these outdoors tables called tapchan, with a large bed for four to eight adults. Drinking tea on the tapchan is a daily ritual. Uzbeks consume a lot of meat, so for a vegetarian it's probably going to be a little challenging. Plov is the signature dish of Uzbekistan. It's a main course typically made with rice, pieces of meat, grated carrots and onions. It's usually cooked in a kazan, or a huge pot, over an open fire. Chickpeas, raisins, barberries or fruit may be added for variation. And if you want to try plov, you gotta come before 1.30 p.m. Because after that time, it's mostly sold out. They cook it everywhere, even in the cotton fields for lunch. It's also the main course for weddings and many other celebrations. And in every region, they prepare it differently. Скажите, пожалуйста, а как часто вы едите плов? Каждый день, почти. Каждый день? Во время обеда только. А, это обеденное блюдо. Ужин, ну, никто не кушает ужин, другое уже блюдо. Другое. Скажите, а на завтрак что едите? Хлеб это обязательно, а чай тоже обязательно. А остальные вот бывает вот, например, сейчас во время ну сезон же, как его фрукты, как его осень, осень. Another important part of the national cuisine is the round bread. Here they call it naan. It comes in all shapes and sizes, thick, thin, small and big, wheat, corn and whatnot. They cook it in these ovens called tandoors. Lots of bread is sold along the roads. Another one is samsa. Those are triangular or round meat pies. They're so delicious and locals eat them burning hot straight out of the tandoor. And of course, don't forget about shish kebab and lots of delicious soups like shurpa, that is a meat soup, and lagman, that is a noodle soup. And also there are so many varieties. At one restaurant I saw eight different varieties of shurpa. Being in Uzbekistan, you gotta visit a local market. It's a whole culture of walking around, shopping, bargaining, and striking conversations. And of course, keep a smile on your face because Uzbekistani people are very friendly. Now let's talk about how Uzbekistan changed after it got its independence in 1991. The first president of Uzbekistan, Karimov, did everything to get rid of the Soviet legacy. But one thing he forgot to do. The Soviet system had to be replaced with a market economy. Instead, Uzbekistan fell into the trap of becoming another post-Soviet dictatorship along with Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Belarus and now Russia. However, ever since the new president, Shavkat Mirziyoyev, came to office in 2016, many steps have been taken in the right direction, which made the economists declare Uzbekistan country of the year in 2019 as the most improved country. Uzbekistan is slowly transitioning from a Soviet-style command economy to a market economy. It is now okay to criticize the government, film videos in most places, even in the subway. But flying drones are still a big no-no. If you try to bring a drone, even a tiny one, you could be facing up to three years in jail. Ridiculous, I know. How's the economy doing? Uzbekistan is the eighth largest cotton producer in the world. Here they call it the white gold. During the Soviet time, Uzbekistan was basically turned into a huge cotton factory. Kids didn't start the school year until all the cotton was picked. Which is why many countries boycotted Uzbek cotton until recently. Luckily, the country has finally eradicated systemic forced labor and child labor. Working conditions have greatly improved since 2020. Almost all cotton in Uzbekistan is still harvested by hand. Каждый с утра, с утра чай, горячий чай. И в обед основном плов. Горячий все есть, все условия. Сегодня собирал, завтра, на следующий день уже утром получит зарплату. Mm, каждый день зарплата. В рублях это 800 тысяч рублей будет. Мы же с детства привыкли. Все собираем, не оставляем ничего. Здесь ничего трудного. 
можно думать о хорошем, о чем-то. Не то, что вот мне так трудно, я собираю. Нет, нет, нет. Завтра я получаю очень хорошие денежки. Прямо да, бесплатный. кормят нас бесплатно. Вон, Каждый вон, день плов. Водичка ходили. есть. Кочешки печеные. Мы с детства, раньше-то во время Союза, вроде бы мы были детьми, мы собирали. А сейчас детям не разрешают. Agriculture in Uzbekistan employs 28% of the country's labor force and contributes 24% of its GDP. Ample sunlight, mild winters, fertile soil, and good pastures make it suitable for cattle raising and growing all sorts of fruits and vegetables. What are they growing? Grapes, apples, peaches, corn, plums, tomatoes, and much more. For example, Uzbekistan is the second largest producer in the world of carrots and apricots. <laughs> Besides agriculture, gold, natural gas, minerals, and mining are also important to the economy. The tourism industry is growing fast. Numerous new restaurants and hotels are being built. To become more tourist friendly, they're introduced tourist police, those are friendly guys who can speak English, and will make sure you're safe and can help you with any questions you might have. You'll see them around every tourist area. Corruption is still a big problem though. I had to give a bribe to a traffic cop once. I took a wrong turn and he was asking for $150. But after some bargaining, 20 bucks was just fine. There's a lot of unnecessary bureaucracy, like you have to get registration papers from each hotel you stay at and keep them. One hotel did not want to check me in because I didn't have the registration papers from the previous one. The official language is Uzbek. Russian is also widely spoken because Uzbekistan has a lot of ties with Russia and many Uzbeks go to work in Russia. Depending on where you go, you'll find Karakalpak, Kyrgyz, and Tajik languages in use. Good jobs are hard to find, and salaries are pretty low. That's why over 60% of cars in the country are running on natural gas. It's cheaper this way. Oh, and if you want to be a millionaire, you have to come to Uzbekistan. When I was renting a car for two weeks, I had to pay 11 million in cash. This is what it looked like. But that's a local currency. It's called SOM. 11 million translates to $1,000. Actually, things have improved because now they have banknotes of large denominations like 100,000, 200,000. Imagine what this would have looked like when the largest bill they had was 5,000. People were carrying cash in large bags. So now let's sum it up. Uzbekistan is a sunny country that has a lot to offer. Historical cities like Bukhara, Samarkand, and Hiva. The big city life of Tashkent, great nature, and mountains. We did not visit every corner of the country, of course, but I hope you got a good impression of the country and its people. Now, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it. And thank you so much. I'll see you in my next video.